So in this video, I'm gonna be using an existing project I have going on to make it easier to illustrate certain things. When you first open Ableton Live, you're gonna be brought to this view that is called the session view. And basically here we have tracks running left to right and the timeline of the song from start to finish going top to bottom. Down at the bottom on each track, we have volume controls, pan controls, you can turn the individual track on and off, you can solo the track, and you can also use send controls and actually enable your individual tracks to record. And by the way, if you wanna learn everything about Session View and why it's super awesome in Ableton Live, you can click this video to learn more about it. Now, if you click the tab button on your keyboard, you can get brought over to the arrangement view. And this is the more traditional timeline that runs from start to finish being left to right. So this is a track running from start to finish. We have tracks going up and down. Uh, tracks by default will switch colors as you start to make new tracks. Or if I hit Command T and make a new audio track, it picks a new color. And if I hit Command or Control Shift T, depending on if you're on Mac or Windows, it's going to make a new MIDI based track. And in terms of the controls, over on the right side, we have the individual on and off of the track solo controls, volume, pan, sends for A and B sends, and then things will be organized in groups, which by the way, if you wanna group some tracks together and make two new tracks, I can just highlight them and hit Command G. There'll be more on that in a sec because you can actually do that pretty much everywhere inside of Ableton Live. And another thing, if for some reason it's more convenient, you can actually switch between these two session view and arrangement views with these buttons on the upper right hand corner of your screen. So now that you understand that, the next most important thing you're gonna do when starting Ableton Live is if you head up to this Live button up top here and hit Preferences, this is gonna bring you to your Preferences window. Alternatively, you can hit Command, Comma, and that will bring that up as well. Uh, first, we have the Look and Feel column. This is really only important for making Ableton look a certain way. I'm using the mid dark setting because I like it. By default, Ableton will look like that, gross, so I don't use that. Now, next we go to the audio tab, and this has the actual audio input information. So if you're recording audio, you probably have an audio interface, and if you have speakers, they're probably hooked up to that audio interface. So you're gonna select audio input, select your interface, select audio output, and select your interface. You might have to go into the input configurations to figure some stuff out if, if your situation is different. The input output sample rate is super important depending on your application. Most of the time I set it to 48,000 hertz. Uh, for some reason this tracks in 44.1, uh, 44,100 hertz. That was just my mistake. Now next we get into this buffer size thing which is super important anytime you're doing anything uh, live like playing MIDI notes at a keyboard or actually tracking a live instrument. So in general, rule of thumb is you want, if you're recording, you want to set this to as small as possible, like 64 samples, and it's going to take some time to think about it. And that will allow you to track with almost no latency, which you can see input and output latency down here. If I go up to 512 samples, this increases. And the reason why you want to increase is if you're going to mixing and mastering, you're not worried about recording. So that gives your computer more time to process all those effects that you're adding on individual tracks. Now next, if we go to the MIDI section, if you're using a MIDI controller like a keyboard or an Ableton Push, this is where you actually set that up and make sure everything is configured correctly. So just look at the manual for whatever device you're using for how you set that up inside of Ableton Live. Next, we go onto the file and folder section. This isn't super critical. I've never really had to touch anything in here, but then the library, nothing critical here. And then the plugin section, this is where it actually starts to get a little critical. So if you wanna use both audio units and VST two and three, you have to make sure that you have those enabled. Anytime you add a new plugin, you're gonna to wanna to hit rescan if you have Ableton Live open at the moment. And aside from that, I don't really touch any things. You, uh, you can make custom folders if you wanna organize your plugins better. I don't really do that. So uh, if you want to, you can go ahead and look into that. And that's pretty much everything in here. You might wanna fool around with these multiple plugin window settings. Depending on your preference, I like to be able to have multiple plugin windows open and I don't like it to auto hide plugin windows when I'm switching between tracks because it gets very annoying. Now we get into the record warp launch settings. This I do tweak a good amount. For example, I think by default it's AIFF, at least if you're on Apple, I like to put it to wave. The count it, I keep as one bar, I keep it to 24 bit depth. You can fool around with some of these other settings, but these are personal preference. Now when we get down here, you're gonna see this option that has auto warp long samples. If you're doing live stuff like a DJ scenario, you might wanna keep this on. Basically, if you drag in a whole song, like a three minute song, it's gonna automatically map it to the tempo of your session. As someone who works in the studio, I don't like that, so I set it to off. The default warp mode, uh, I'll explain this in a sec, but 
I like to set it to complex because that's what I use most often. If most of the things you're warping are drums, you might want to use beats. So this is a good time to show you what warping actually is. If you click on any audio file twice, double click it. Uh, if you go down to this corner here, this is where you can control the individual settings for the exact audio clip that you have open. So it's not going to affect this clip and this clip. It's only going to affect this clip. You can transpose it. You can change the volume and you can change the tempo in the warp mode. So if you have warp enabled, by default, it goes to beats if you have that setting in here set to beats, but I set it to complex. If it's a drum file, you're probably gonna wanna use beats. And if it's a vocal track, you're probably gonna wanna use complex pro. Uh, complex is basically a more memory, it's better managing memory than complex pro. It's much more memory intensive. So that's kind of how you'll, you'll fool around with that. Whew, okay, so that was a lot of talking. So now what happens if you actually want to record something? So I'm gonna use a MIDI track for sake of example for this. So I already have a mini track up here. Again, you can hit Command Shift T or com Control Shift T if you're on Windows and the track selected. So now you need to actually get an instrument on that. So just for example, I'm gonna double click this analog synthesizer. This is a built-in Ableton Live synth. You can see all the settings for it down there. I'm not gonna show you how to use this particular synth. So I'm just gonna go up here, I already have it open. And if I wanna use this piano sound, anytime you click on one, It'll give you a little teaser, and if I drag it on top of something that already exists, a preset for that, it'll preset this synth to that sound. And now I can touch my keyboard. I don't know if you can hear that on the mic, but uh, it's making sound when I touch the keyboard inside of this track. Now you might wanna add some audio effects to that, so you can add an EQ, and you can add a compressor, and maybe you actually wanna use one of these presets, so you can open up any of these presets and drag it on here, and you'll get a different sound. You can also hit a, a uh, audio effect and hit delete, and that'll delete it, move, and open up this EQA. Now, when you open it, you might notice it that it doesn't actually have this cut at the bottom. That's because I make this, because most of my tracks need that cut. I right click it and hit save as default preset. Every time I load up EQ8, it's gonna have that cut, which is super convenient. You can also make something that you use all the time, hit save, and it's gonna allow you to save a, uh, a preset inside of your user library section over here. This is a great time for me to go over this section over here. So up top, we're gonna have this collections window. If you want to control which, which colors you have enabled, hit this edit button, and you can enable them. You can just right click and rename any of these sections. I use this to organize things that I use most often. So I have a synths folder, a samplers folder, uh, vocal effects I haven't popular yet. This computer is kind of new. Mixing effects and mastering effects. And then we have the built-in kind of Ableton Live categories. You can also control which ones of these show. Uh, sounds and, and drums I don't use super often. The most often I use are instruments, audio effects, sometimes MIDI effects, and plugins for sure. So if you're using audio effects, audio units, VST and VST3, they'll all be organized in these nice folders. Again, don't have all my plugins on this computer yet because it's kind of new. Now, if you actually have samples in your computer, you can actually just drag and drop the folder in here and it's gonna link to those. So this is my cymatics folder. I know I have a ton of cymatics uh, samples, but it just allows you to easily nav navigate inside and just drag samples directly in. Bam, now we're gonna sample. Now that I have this here, I wanna delete it. Maybe for some reason I only wanna delete part of it. So I can just drag around, highlight stuff, and delete stuff. And if I want to actually warp this, I can just uh, grab this, hold shift, and you see how it's not warping. Now I explained warping a little bit, but you actually have to turn it on. So now if I grab it and hold shift, I can just extend the duration of this. And that's gonna change the timeline of that. You can do this to any kind of short sample, any loop, or even a whole song that you put into it. And if you wanna manually toggle the results, you can go down here and change the BPM to whatever you want to match the song exactly that you have. So now that we're back in this view here, uh, I'll get back to the tangent that I left, showing you how to actually record stuff. So this record button here will toggle which track is the actively recorded track. Now, when you wanna actually record something, you just select wherever you want to record. And then up here, I usually turn on the metronome. There's some settings for how the metronome uh, performs and sounds. There's also a tempo control for the tap, the track. You can tap tempo anything in and you can change like the, the signature and the, uh, the, the count in settings there. Then you just click this record button up here. It's gonna count in. And it's gonna start tracking. And now 
you can move, well, actually you can just hit stop to stop it or you can hit space, that's typically what I do. And of course, play is the play button. Now I can double click this and it'll bring me into the mini clip. You can also just double click anywhere in a mini track and open up a new mini clip. And if you just wanna extend this, you can't just do that. You wanna actually change it down here in the length settings. Another thing you can do is say, you know you want it to be this long, you can highlight a section, right click, and then hit insert mini clips, and that's gonna give you the exact right length of the clip. When you're inside a mini clip, you can just drag any note you want around. You can also just simply double click or double click and drag to create different notes that you want to put in there. If you wanna change how this looks, you can click over here and then move left and right to change the zoom of it. You can also scroll. Uh, if you hold your command, zoom in and out, you'll zoom in and out in the view, and then you can scroll left and right if you're using a, uh, using a magic mouse on Mac. I don't know what to do on Windows. Now that same philosophy applies to the main view up here. You can just hold control, zoom in and out, or go left and right. You can also use this thing up here. Oop, I clicked the wrong button. This thing up here, and this will allow you to go left and right, or up and down, you can also simply just select different track sections up top. If you wanna to play from a certain section, you can just click anywhere and it'll start playing right from that moment. You probably noticed that when I double clicked on a MIDI clip, it brings up this view down here, but how do you actually get back to your plugins? Well, the way I like to do it is I hold shift and I press tab and that alternates between those two views. Now I'm back to my plugin view. There's also a thing down here where you can select between your actual MIDI clip and the actual uh, audio effects that you have on that particular track. So eventually you're gonna have all these different tracks of all these different sounds, and you're gonna wanna probably master them. Now you already know how to put in effects onto the track and get the sound you want, change the volume and pan things around to get the mix you want. But when you wanna master, you can actually just click the master bus down here, and this is where you're gonna put plugins on the entire bus. And it's it's, as simple as it sounds. Now, I'm not gonna go into the actual details of mastering. If you're interested in that, you can click this video right here where I show you how to master for Spotify. But when you actually get finished with your track, the way that you export it is either hit this button uh, file up here and export audio video clip. I like to hit Command Shift R. I like to think of it as render or raster, uh, <laughs> raster and audio. Uh, don't worry about it, I'm a nerd. And here, there's some settings, for example, if you wanna render out the master, all individual tracks, selected tracks, or specific tracks, you can change the render start stop time. By default, it just grabs everything in your view. If you want, you can also back in the timeline here, like highlight a certain section. And then when you go to there, it'll actually reflect that change from, uh, so what is that, 611 to 40-ish, or no. Yeah, so it's gonna be 34 length, which ends up being about 40 bar 40. Now you can also render things as a loop, convert to mono, normalize, all stuff like that. Most of the time I only focus on settings like file type being wave, bit type being 24. And then if I want an MP3 version as well, and then you simply just hit export and your track is gonna start rendering out. Now up at the top here, there are a few important options. For example, this MIDI arrangement overdub button. By the way, the reason why I know the name of that is because if you mouse over in the lower left-hand corner, you're gonna see a description of everything around the, the entire window. Anytime you mouse over something, it gives you a little tip, which is super handy for when you forget. But this MIDI arrangement thing is gonna allow you to record over a MIDI track. So if I don't have that enabled and I click record, and then I look here, I'm actually overwriting my MIDI. But now if I highlight that and then I click record from here, it's not overriding my MIDI, and so I can put something on top of an existing MIDI track. I usually leave that on. Now, in terms of the automation arm, this is gonna allow you to record manual uh, session, manual automation changes in your automation. By the way, if you wanna go to automation, you just click this little stretchy symbol, and that's gonna allow you to actually go in here and select certain parameters that you can automate over the course of your track. Now, this, there's this session record button. This is when you're in the session view and you wanna record uh, individual clips into the session. So when you work in the arrangement, you typically don't use it. And since I use an Ableton push, I find myself never actually using this button ever. But if you don't use an Ableton push, then you're probably gonna use it. Now, there's also a button here that's very, very common that you're gonna press is loop. And I actually never end up pressing it because I'll actually just highlight a section, hit Command L, and that's how you loop it. You can also just like highlight a thing here and hit Command L. There's a few other things here that I never really touch. Maybe they're useful, but obviously not enough for me to figure them out and use them. I mentioned I would show you more about the grouping thing, so let me just make some more tracks. I showed you how you can hit uh, highlight some tracks at Command G, and now we have a group. Any plugins that I put on this group are kind of, it's like a mini master of anything that's put inside of there. 
Now, if I also have this group and I have a bunch of plugins, uh, maybe this is a common stack I like to use. So I just highlight all these plugins and hit Command G and that creates an audio effect rack. And this effect rack can be saved video rack and I can go onto like this track and I can drag that in and now I have that anywhere and anytime I open up another song I can use that. Alright that was a ton of talking but I hope you found this video helpful and it wasn't too fast to be helpful. If you have any questions let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to answer them and if you want to learn more about Ableton Live Session View and why I think it's so important then check out this video right here and you can learn all about it. As usual thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.